Hi, everybody. So before we get going, uh, just a quick thing here. Uh, if the poem you're about to read may be inappropriate for children, please say so. Uh, likewise, if the poem may be challenging or triggering for someone, please just uh, say a word or two about that. Give people a moment to turn the volume down or step out of the room. So with that, I'm very happy to see you all. Um, our first poet is Aaron Ballou, who is the author of Infanta, which was chosen by Hayden Carruth for the National Poetry Series. She also is the author of One Above and One Below, winner of the Midland Authors Prize and Ohioana Poetry Award, Black Box, a Los Angeles Times book, list, book prize finalist, Slant Six, which was named one of the 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Times, and Come Hither Honeycomb, which came out last year. Her poems have appeared in many places. Please welcome Erin Ballou. Hi, thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who's, uh, who, who supports this program and public libraries are the best and librarians are the best and people who bring poetry into our communities uh, are the best. So thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Um, I think I probably uh, made a mistake and said the book came out last year. Actually, the new book just came out a couple weeks ago um, because I don't understand numbers. And so I'm sure I just wrote down a, a random series of numbers for Leela to read. Um, so it's very new. It's a new book called Come Hither Honeycomb from Copper Canyon Press. Um, and I'm going to read maybe five, six short poems. And um, most of them don't need a lot of setup. So I'll just start with this poem called Your Failure. Um, the other thing I should probably say is often, not always, but often my titles just read into my poem because I'm too lazy to come up with titles is I think pretty much what it comes down to. So this is the poem, Your Failure. Your failure was mostly predictable and daily. Like the wee fluorescent lizards still creeping greenly along the front door frame who think a house the image of escape, despite how clear the world is just behind them. Who wasting never know we never mean to trap them. We try to help. But God, it's tough to take this animal made complete from dumb instinct. The urge that drives them steadily amiss, constant and unfair. It hurts to watch them scramble, do laps throbbing, the Swiss precision of their fear. Now sorting out the wreck, she digs her broom into another hidden grubby crack to find the husk these creatures leave us because of what they lack. And the next poem is, uh, a poem that has an epigraph from the French writer Guy de Maupassant. And he has this wonderful kind of epistolary essay called Letter from a Madman, which I highly recommend to you. Um, and so the epigraph for this poem is, and from the moment that everything is limitless, what remains? The man who fills in space. The man who fills in space is petrified the outlines of each table, counter, his and the spouse's nightstands all blur beneath the mess of his collections. Covering his mouth, the man often yawns reflexively. It's hard to feel your own unease so tedious, a house too quiet. And he is growing weightless, churlish, lapsing into sulks as the bees that work inside him plot more often to refuse him the lullabying comfort of their swarm. But when he pokes the canker of that great blank whatever he never hopes to find, he swears he hears it laugh, the terrible what of what is not. It yawns right back at him. The man who fills in space drips with stalagmites he fashions for his temple. Pillars made from leisure magazines, 
sour smelling foreign change, a plastic bag engorged with dead men's wallets, the treasure of his mother's broken seal meal. All the stuff of him pressed lovingly beneath a pelt of dust in which he sometimes thinks to write his name. And when he leaves each night to make himself less awfully not, and drinks to make the bees return, searching for the necessary spot from which to phone his mistress, sometimes the moon comes by, peering through the window of his car to wonder at this man who fills in space. And the man looks back at her, marveling at how lonely she must be. Those barren miles, the nothing of a few golf balls, a clutch of silent flags planted in her porous white. Though he nearly recalls the astronaut who left a tiny silver pin behind, proven someone he can't quite remember claimed another place he'll never go. The man who fills in space, he thinks of this while considering the moon, the sadness of the object, that single sharp prick alone somewhere in the universe. I was asked to, um, I was asked to write a poem for uh, Academy of American Poets Poem a Day's Shelter in Place series. I think this was the last poem I wrote for the book. Um, <clears throat> so this, this is what came about uh, in that moment of thinking about how the pandemic has kind of, where our mind has turned in that particular place. So this is a poem called As for the Heart. I am come to the age of pondering my lastness, buying what seems likely my final winter coat at Macy's, or when a glossy magazine so very blithely asked me to renew. As for my heart, that ever pixelated tweener, how tediously long I've been expected to baby her complaints, unloved, unloved, alarmed and stubborn clock, refusing to listen even as the more intrepid tried. Now she mostly mutters to herself, though occasionally there's some clanging, a tinny sound, like the radiator in a Southie triple-decker, fractious as a pair of cowboy boots in a laundromat's dryer. It's always been this joke the old ones know. In such a state of nearly doneness, the world grows sweeter, as if our later days were underscored with music from a nocturne saddest oboe hidden in the trees. Just yesterday, while standing in the kitchen, my son complained nonstop about his AP psych class while wolfing warmed up bucatini from a crazed pink china bowl. Shiny, kvetching creature. Even if I could tell him what he doesn't want to know, I wouldn't. But now the pissy storm that spent all afternoon flapping like a dirty sheet has wandered off to spook some other neighborhood. There's one barbed weed pushing up greenly through my scruffy loripetalum, and it falls on me, this little cold rain the day has left. You know, sometimes you hear your own poems out loud and you're like, wow, that's kind of sad and moody. Um, <laughs> apparently I've been in a sad and moody mood uh, when I was writing that book. So I'm actually gonna just finish up with I think maybe two poems from uh, the book before this, which is a book called Slant Six. Um, and the poem I'm gonna read is one called The Body is a Big Sagacity. And if you recognize that line, it's because it's a line of uh, from Nietzsche, the philosopher Nietzsche. Um, I had written this poem and, I, and there's a long story that I won't tell you, but you know when you have a poem and it's just, it's fine, it's okay but it's just not doing what it's supposed to do. And then I had people over and somebody, and I always keep a bunch of books in my bathroom. And one of the books in my bathroom is the world's greatest philosophers. And somebody had left it open having a browse in the lavatory. And I picked it up the next day and it was like, I saw that line, the body is a big sagacity. 
Stagacity basically meaning wisdom. And it was that thing, right? Like randomly picking up a book off the bathroom floor where I finally figured out that the poem wanted to be in conversation with Nietzsche. So when you hear Fred show up in the poem, because I know him well, I call him Fred, um, that will be Nietzsche who, who shows up to, to talk with the speaker for a minute. The body is a big sagacity is another thing Nietzsche said that hits me as pretty specious while sitting in my car in the Costco parking lot, listening to the ballet mechanique of metal buggies shrieking as each super singular and self-contained wisdom of this Monday morning rumbles its jumbo packs of toilet paper and Diet Coke up the sidewalk. So count me a despiser of the body, though I didn't generate this woe any more than the little man parked next to me, now attempting the descent from his giant truck, behemoth whose hemi roars like a melting reactor and stands as the ego's corrective to the base methods by which the body lets the spirit down. Buzz clipped, tidy as an otter, He's high and tight in his riding heels. Pearl snaps on the little man's shirt throw tiny lasers when he passes. But who isn't more war than peace? And how ridiculous to suffer this, to be a little man with itty hands and bitty feet, to know yourself lethal, but crazy glued for life to the most laughable engine, recycled, rewired product of genes and whatever our mamas thought to smoke. The spirit gets no vote, Fred. My body once was whole, symmetrical, was actually beautiful for three consecutive years, expensive as a rented palace. And yet I blew that measly era watching my clock hands move as if I were the trigger rigged to homemade dynamite. But if you would look inside me into all the lonely seeming folks here loading their heavy bags, you'd hope we're something more than a sack of impulse, of soul defined by random gristle. Which is why the little man pauses on the sidewalk, why he stops to look at me looking at him, this pocket-sized person whose gaze unkinks a low carry voltage from my coccyx. And thus speaks Zarathustra, you great star, what would your happiness be had you not those for whom you shine? Ask the little man, neither ghost nor plant, his boot heels ringing down the concrete. You know, big box stores sometimes hand you a poem. Little known fact, if you're looking to, looking for poems out there in the universe, parking lot of a big box store, I recommend it. You know, and I chose this this last poem as a, as a love poem. Um, and I realized the other day when I was giving a different reading and I was looking through my poems that I was like, I never read this poem out loud. It's probably because it makes me feel weird because it's a, it's a love poem. And it's one of those love poems for a, a relationship that almost happened and then didn't. Um, and you know, anyway, you'll find out in the poem. I also realized I don't always do this, but when there's a, there's a, in the poem, the you in the poem has gifted the speaker a copy of George Herbert's poems. And so George Herbert is, when it says Herbert, that's the George I'm talking about. The other thing you should know about this poem is uh, its landscape is in Ohio. Um, and it's talks about the Olentangy River. And so that's where the Olentangy River is, is in Ohio. Um, so I'll say goodbye and thank you for your attention today. And I um, appreciate getting to meet the new poets here and thank you for your attention. So this is Olentangy River. Hardest day ever in Ohio and gray and coldest as if there were another day in Ohio, as if the sun that spelled briefly where we walked for hours freezing were a magic as I needed it to be. 
Gollum's proof and Yenta's blessing to those many nights of driving past your house. Inexorable, self-embarrassed, fuller than an itch, something better than this sore, those nights not knowing where exactly, but inevitable and clearly set on a direction, that place where I was driving because of course there was you somewhere sleeping or toasting bread or staring tired at TV and ending lost, always lost. Still, you've never been imagined as I imagined you today with a wife sleeping in Ohio and babies down the hall, not ever so reached for. What did you do there by the Olentangy, once called stone for its knife, and therefore my soul caught at the place which is fitting, wedded as I was, and sudden in Ohio, where objects are steep to climb and wrong. But you, walking with your Herbert, this gift, a little nothing, what you offered on my shelf now, hand whitening in the freezing, and you ungloved. And there your voice always, where we are walking, will always be walking by the Olentangy, freezing. Thank you very much. Our next featured poet is Eris Keon. Eris is an imprint C. Glenn Camber Fellow pursuing her MFA at the University of Houston. She, she ranked number 10 in the 2020 Women of the World Poetry Slam. Her poems are published with Right About Now, Underground Journal, Houston Review of Books, The West Review, and elsewhere. She is a Pushcart nominee and a 2020 Best of the Net finalist. Please welcome Eris Keon. Hello, y'all, and thank you, Public Poetry, for having me. I'm very thankful to be here. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, the first couple of my poems from out of my book, Black Academic. Um, it's a chat book, um, and I'm also selling it. So if you uh, want to DM me um, or message me, I'm happy to sell you one. Um, these are fairly old, but I love them, and they're dear to my heart. The first poem I'm going to read is called In Which I No Longer See My Face as Full of Potential. You whole wheat honey suckle you, stiff stem neck with a sweet turned tooth, high cheek bout hard to swallow, dimples deep in tea tree, shea, aloe, and vitamin E, split bottom lip, ripped rib of Adam, go on, grin too wide, taste your pumpernickel chin, tongue kiss a mirror like it looks like you, thank God, for the laugh lines that give birth to laugh lines. For giving love at first sight, a second and third chance. For the as is and as is. For the hours you spent angling your face into an unfamiliar gospel, I gift you a glossed and golden conceit. Go on, end your prayers in your name too. The next poem I will read is called Circus Act. Black girl be the best magic trick with how she vanishes under a spotlight like poof. See the trap door that be the sidewalk by the train station, be the bus stop, be the back seat of a ride share. What I mean is one time I made it home on a phone with no battery and the crowd was unimpressed. Their groans echoing about the bleachers, give us fanfare, they chanted, give us fire. For the tightrope walk, which be my nightly commute, I do that in my sleep. A man spits through the peanuts in his teeth and I disappear behind my closed mouth smile. Speed up into the lamplight, swallow the flaming hoops behind my tongue. Stunt one, performed in a continuous night. No matter the hour when she is blindfolded, foldable enough to fit into a trunk or into the hands of a man she learned never loved her back, black girl. Be the best assistant, 
with how she falls victim to a show she never asked to be in see how she contorts in order to fit through the tightest of holes see how she be so seen yet so unnoticed as she slips through the cracks in the crowd looks around gasps she's gone she's gone a roaring applause awaiting the next illusion don't worry she wasn't really there and everyone settles in their seats a bit more comfortable. Don't see who is going missing one by one in the audience dwindling until there is only you left with the mess of spit and shells around your feet and no one else to clean it. And I think I have time for one more poem. So I'll read uh, a poem that's very dear to me, um, Away With The Sun. I'm afraid to have a sun, so instead I'll birth a moon. I'd have to watch him grow so far from me, but so, so bright, his light rippling the mirrored surface of sea. I'd see the craters in his face before they fade in the morning. I'm afraid to have a sun, so instead I'll birth a moon, because what is night if not the opposite of sun? How one always returns, how mine may not, and isn't it telling that the root of the word night is absence, like what's left in my hands when he's here one day and gone the next, please. Let him stay in the blue of otherworldliness, say the womb, say the sky or even the sea how many of my ancestors were divers, how they knew that the bottom of the ocean was better to touch with both hands than this ground with bare feet if I were ever to have a son. I pray he'd be a moon so I could bury him before the world does, beneath a blanket of stardust where blue and only blue can touch him his light, taking millions upon millions of miles to reach the ground where he dies long after I do. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Very moving. Our next featured poet is Bradley Earl Hogue. His poetry appears in numerous anthologies and journals, most recently in Courtship of the Winds, Fleas on the Dog, Angry Old Man, Shanty Arts, Event Horizon, The Transnational, and Split Rock Review. He has published four chapbooks and his book, Nebular Hypothesis, was published by Caw and Crow Press. Please welcome Bradley Hogue. Thank you. I'm glad to be here again. And uh, I'm actually thrilled to be able to share some of these with you. I've picked, uh, recently sort of given up on writing about my own life. <laughs> uh, it's started writing, trying to find other avenues uh, to, to take it. Um, so these are poems written while I've been hiking through the woods. I'm now living in California, lived in Houston for 30 years, but uh, these, are, these are kind of local to, to this landscape. The first one is Portola Redwoods State Park. The Portola Redwoods exist on other planets. To see them, you must pass through portals scattered throughout the forest. They lead to many worlds, each unique though you might not notice them shimmering as sunlight through branches as you hike the trail in front of you. You pass through so many portals at so many angles, you cannot tell what world you are trespassing at any given moment. You might, not, you might note a change from the air, from fetid to crisp, or your breathing from labored to still. But if you are not paying close attention, you will believe yourself to be still earthbound. And when you are tired, and wish to return home, you must always double check the pattern of trees along your path, the direction of swirling bark, of lichen and lightning strike, to be sure you are returned. The portals disappear at night. You will not be able to find your way home till morning. And please be careful what you leave behind. The portals welcome any living being, which is why fire can also pass through if we are careless, just as the birds that nest in the trees and the sunlight that guides our sojourn. Uh, the next uh, two or three, I think that's the heavenly I can fit into this first block, uh, are all titled after exoplanets. Um, the poems were written first, and the but I found an exoplanet that kind of 
a fit. This first one is TOI 1338b. The TOI stands for Test Objects of Interest. So it's uh, one of the first planets, exoplanets found. On TOI 1338b, reality unfolds with the sun. As the sun rises, reality begins. As it sets, reality stops. Reality itself does not dissolve, mind you, it is simply wayward. It restarts with the light just where it ended. If you drive from light to dark, you disappear, truly gone from reality, not just frozen. You will reappear in the morning. At the edge, you enter darkness. So remember to always drive into the dark if you want to be sure to catch the sunrise. All right. The next one is Kepler 16b. On planet Kepler 16b, there is no perhaps, and time has no arrow. There is no growing older and no regret. The planet does not turn, so there is no change in seasons. It is as if you could stand in place and see in all directions of space and time that all you have to do to travel through time is remain still like rock, recording your life in layers. Let your life's moments wash over you like tide against cliff face as you dissolve into rubble, compact into glauconite, rise by tectonic force into mountain, become buried by layer upon layer of earth until pressure transforms you into shale, phylite, schist, gneiss. Your id exposed, shining like quartz crystal. Uh, a number of these poems are actually have two, two suns. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about sunrise and sunset and how we tell time. On planet, this is TOI 237. On a planet with no night, twin M star, M dwarf suns in sync, one rising as the other sets, sunrise on one horizon, sunset on the other. There is no time to rest. No chance for retrospect, shun. No hiding, no dreaming, only fear of the known. Okay, I think it looks like maybe two more. K2-136b. On planet K2-136b, fog rolls in and fog rolls out. In its wake, the distant horizon ebbs and flows like sleeping dog, vigilant, it's startled by thunder, by flash of lightning, by any sudden movement. Do point a ghost like swamp gas condensing, convincing inhabitants that anything is real if they believe it. Everyone on K2 136B rushes inside whenever sheets of rain threaten to wash away the fog, like alien energy scanning all their secrets, probing, then moving on, leaving nothing but their denuded doubts. Right, and the last one is Glyec 581E. It never bothered inhabitants of Glyec 581E that the universe is not real without imaginary numbers, that distance and time are the same dimension, that the universe is defined by emptiness, only back holes whole rest left to be formed in the mind of conscious observer. They were totally bewildered when we arrived with all our bells and whistles, our shouts and whispers, attempting to bang thought against the fabric of the universe, hoping to weave the cosmos together with ribbons of our imagination. Thank you. Thank you. I really <laughs> love that last line. <laughs> All right. Our next featured poet is Kaya Osborne. Kaya Osborne used to be a friendly poet. Nowadays, they're just looking for the loudest indica strain. They do tar tarot readings, doula work, and stand up tragedy for money. And if you'd like to follow them, the Twitter handle is Kaya Dahome. Please welcome Kaya Osborne.
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kaya Osborne, and I will be reading y'all some poems today. The first one I have available and ready. Um, let's see if I can find it. It was just open, and now it's closed on porch. Okay, hold on. I hate having my things ready to go and then they're not ready to go. Here we go, okay. <clears throat> so this poem is called, Have You Ever Halted the Parade for a Second? Um, are there any trigger warnings I need to add? This poem does have the N word in it, but I'm going to be censoring it. So besides that, there are no other cuss words. <laughs> Have you ever halted the parade for a second? No, and I've only just considered stopping. It doesn't hurt enough. The pain has only just settled into the grooves. Maybe there's spendable gold where these sobs end. Mars is in retrograde, so fake like you care about understanding me so we can all go home a little earlier. I'm tired of war metaphors for bodies that have learned their borders, but I am also tired of negotiating with a language that sits on my tongue like arsenic pulp. Essentially, I am unlearning the act of being owned. I have so far done this bloodlessly, therefore I am failing. My first mistake was having heroes. The second was choosing the living. When you're a psychic, no one's ever telling you the truth. That's why tarot readers are always single. As a poet, I am obligated to love. As an N-word, I'm supposed to know better than that. Did you know the Hottentot Venus spoke perfect French? Thank you for that, that's the first one. Um, the second one, <clears throat> the second one is called Moon Cricket. I pick the scales the burn created off and fling, fling them to the floor, settling like rose petals on a lover's sheets. I imagine the spiders will use my forfeited melanin to dress their homes, opaque flakes of scar tissue glittering like gold leaf in their webs when the sunlight hits them just right. This is the only part of my body I will surrender to the dirt. I refuse to bleed into the soil or pillage the bedrock with my death song. Let me be alive as long as the river runs or as loud as thunder dances on the flittering hearts of the creatures that fear it. I am so afraid of dying, but so fatigued by life. The drudgery of suffering only sings higher when you're black, when you've tossed body after body into the silt with your terrified silence. I want to say I am like my mother, brave and beautiful and strong, but the truth is I actually cannot stand up to white boys when they anger me. I actually cannot work hard. I actually cannot remember to brush my teeth. I actually cannot have children. Only thing I have ever had to offer the world was my song. I open my mouth and a garden jumps out, the petunias fox trotting, the tulips hitting a two-step, the roses, of course the roses belong to the ministry of the Charleston, a fragrance toss over the shoulders or a spin between the legs. My tongue does not dance, but what more can you want from a minister? The teeth are my choir and with all parties present and worshiping, a new doctrine arises from the ashes of my failure to die. It sounds like a vibrato's release at midnight. All right, so one more, um, one more. And then my turn is over. This, so this next poem is in conversation with the last poem. This poem has cuss words in it as well, um, as well as the N word. Um, so if you have kids around you or something like that, you wanna mute this part. <clears throat> this poem is called Mind Altering Substances. 
I quit art to be a teenager in college. F growth, B word. I feed my blood to rocks now and pray for my next $20 to come from dead people. I avoided calling when they were alive. I've been resentfully audacious since I came to understand myself as living, simply too big to hide in my kindness. I make easy enemies like I take S's. Eternally hating it here in my crinkly inward brain. I hate unlearning the wretched assignment of slow suicide while the world makes quick work of killing me. I'm a lazy hottentot, a good for nothing songless cricket that has given up the moon's rapacious tutelage. I only want to see my breath leave me in smoke so I know I still hold a spirit. I only want to hear the soft dead, no thunderous tremoring hankship of my most recent losses. I only want to hear my own rage in the bluster of this iron bound, barnacled, boundaryless identity. Hand me the gas can so I may light the match with my tongue, please. If I allow you to torch me into a tarnished, silent memory, you'll save the juiciest blood of my few ontological victories to feed your children everything they don't deserve from my love. Thank you, I'm done. Well, let's welcome back uh, three out of four of our featured poets. Um, first up, Eris Keon. All right, hello, lovely folks. Wonderful reading. It was such a pleasure to listen to all of y'all. I'm gonna read three poems. They're all fairly uh, mid-length. So the first poem is called uh, the title leads into the poem. Every train I've ever run for has left me and still I find myself gripping my straps and pounding pavement, waving down whoever's evening blurs behind the power lines and purpling clouds. I do not wish loneliness of any kind upon anybody, but I'd take it in its truest form. I've leaned, sleep drunk against the change machine, praying for one midnight of no one. Stood taut next to lingering hands and too close cigarette breath. Lied on my age, laughed away a missed stop, centered my gravity before the right jolt plops me into the wrong lap. Everyone's got ghosts at home, don't they? Some trail us from the station first. A flickering lamp has never caused me to question my shadow, but a glance will get me sick at the sight of me. I've wished my existence into the blue seats that indigo hour of anything goes. I've stilled myself so street light I couldn't release, release my breath until morning. I do not wish loneliness of any kind upon anybody, but show me that someone without someone they can't shake. Show me their stop and I'll show you the longest way home. Every back alley exit where I bounced my name off the brick and dodged the echo. My second poem is called The Kiss of an If. Sweet vermilion of eager lips, all sunset hot, the sweat without promise and the drop jaw glance, oh, the dance of it all, I'd risk me too. It's capital T thrill, how it vibrates, chills, wouldn't you? If you could almost, just, the not quite next to, the never inside enough, the glistening neck like morning dew, like a midnight stroll buzzing from the tip of your toes, even if it meant your aching heels, the morning back, wouldn't you? The weight, the snap and spark, the frisk of your feet under the, di the dinner table, when your eyes flutter shut, when you water your plants in the windowsill with a little more wind chime in your whisper, the whisper you save for soft things like newborns and dandelions and the turn of your cheek towards her when the day breaks, wouldn't you? If she called you by all of your names, if it meant the last time you could inhale without a hitch, that strip of light about the skyline growing dimmer by day, if it meant the possibility of the no more and never again, the reach and retreat, the sinking in your stomach, this here, this senseless back and forth, the onslaught of afternoons without my chin in your hands, our joined breaths after a joke, 
even if it meant the absence of me, wouldn't you? Let even the trail of her finger ruin us. My last poem is called Replying in the Hour of God. Splintering blue, sweep soft like a breath on my neck. Let twilight sit like a shell, the smooth of its belly deep in the dirt. For now, I hold your face between the blinds, your flood staining the floorboards before morning. I'll admit, I knew your voice once, that silhouette of horror lurking in the side streets in still shot evenings, the whistle before war, the rumble before it rains. It was a comfort to me to know not what windstorms your word rustled into the day, only the never ending hollow of its depth, the boundless echo of its reach. It carried all I had no name for. My hands, unlearned and untroubled. My tongue with its frivolous wonder. How certain I slept, convinced of the answer to everything that was. But here, before the spill of day, when the moon cracks open its jaw to feed the restless ones, I feel your whisper knock at the shallow of me, carving like a spade hole by hole. Like wood, I am taken for more than I am. Sunrise begins its rosy peak and I am left gasping for the black of night at some old empty, a nothing so full only darkness could swallow it. Lord, this is well overdue. I'm afraid to know too soon. This life and the ease of it, I've grown familiar. It's peddling days, the quiet afternoons, your blade making room for a coming terror, some dumbbell of a life I do not wish to carry. This warmth from your hand waves to that distant ache, that sinking something held in your palm. I don't know who I will become the hour a new grief becomes me. But let me remember this, the dawn of this aching open. So close to your lips, I taste your first kiss, that salty caress of the earth and you, the me you made, moments before knowing too much, before the wide eye and bottomless bite, the fruit in my hand, the sweet down my chin. Thank y'all so much for listening. Thank you very much. All right, let's welcome back Bradley Hogue. Thank you. Uh, my second uh, session is going to pick up kind of where the first one left off with another poem about uh, a grove of redwoods, which is, it's kind of amazing how primordial it is to step into it, but it's, you step out and you're back in the real world. So it's called Hindi Woods. Imp, primordial. Mosses marking trees like telescoping stratigraphy. Various colors spiraling up the bark. Twisting trunks of trees like strands of DNA. Kaleidoscope of ages traveling back in time. Hypnotizing portal to an epoch before. Scars of management for leisure. Momentary mindfulness disrupted by voices. Becoming cacophony of conversations ripping the forest apart. Laughing children, barking, not wolves, but dogs, engineered to serve and protect. Sirens, beeping of trucks backing up, reminding this grove is surrounded by civilization. Fire scorched redwoods, not lightning strike, not smoldering from within, but spreading like disease. Invasive mold killing tap oak and Elysium. There is no escape to be found in this quaint park, bordered by orchard, river, roads. If you stop to contemplate naturescape, sound, you can hear the cars. The more silent you become, the more disturbance enters, surrounding and brought in, turning the forest, not sylvan, but rather into church, in position of mind, mankind's mind onto nature, still somehow comforting on a primordial level. And I'll return to the uh, exoplanets. This one's 55 Campcrete E. 
Upon arrival on 55 Cancri E, you might notice gills sprout from your neck, lest you gasp for air from the humidity as thick as sauna. Even above water on this world, one cannot breathe air wet as alveoli. Oxygen exchange is physical chemistry. Nasal membranes saturated to dew point drown. So be warned, do not travel to 55 Cancri E unprepared for the heat. The wet sky encompassing like flood, oceans vapors sweltering like fever. The next one is K218B. Uh, and this one and, and a couple of their follow-up um, kind of kind of a theme about petroglyphs and, and a poem I wrote sort of adapted to this actually from a really old poem. On K218B, words fall from the sky like cosmic rays. All you have to do to hear ancestral voices is tuned to the right frequency. Once found, they emerge like bugs when lights are effulgent. Though it is still nearly impossible to grok translation, to hold them in your hands for your children to see like lightning bugs, afraid to open fist too much, lest the words escape and scurry back into the dark. And this one is Proxima B. The first explorers to make their way to Proxima B discovered the words of previous inhabitants manifested into rocks, broken and scattered, some jutting from graves like shattered dreams, others dust covered or sand blasted, beseeching epiphany, succeeding settlers, incapable of deciphering the relics, spent their days wandering through the spoken stones, carving their own graffiti onto the literal petroglyphs, as if time favored the recent and Providence conquest. My last one is actually based on a, uh, or if accurate or not, but a description of or one idea of what might have happened on Easter Island. It's called Kepler 62F. Research now suggests that the carvings on Kepler 62F were commissioned by rulers of competing sects, dividing the planet into 11 segments competing through displays of wealth rather than might, decreeing that massive statues be rolled along logs cut from trees, similarly to those that carried tiki boats to shores on Earth's Easter Islands. And at once the last tree fell for this purpose, the statues were toppled in anger at the foolishness of the leaders who allowed trees to be sacrificed so that no more boats could be built and dolphins could not be harvested and birds and other sources of food would perish, and soil for farming would erode, and society would collapse. Because of personal greed and the willingness to mortgage the future to maintain the status quo, and the end of the story has yet to be told, but the story is repeated many times. Thank you very much. And I really do want to thank you, Fran, and everybody at, at Public Poetry at the library. It's, it's so great to reconnect with the Houston poetry community. There's nothing like Houston's poetry community. It's fantastic. So thank you again for letting me be part of it. Aw, thank you. Really glad you could be here too. And that was great. And I've been thinking about Proxima B myself. You know, it happens when you read the news, I guess. So next up, let's welcome back featured poet Kai Osborne. Hello everyone, um, I'm back. So these next couple of poems, I would like to issue trigger warnings for references to sexual assault. Both of these poems deal with sexual assault. Um, and then the last one, I don't think has any trigger warnings besides being another poem with some cuss words in it. Yeah. More men have raped me than have loved me. I don't know who my body belongs to, but it is not me. 
Exhaustion haunts my skin now, wearing a mask of burgundy liquor wrapped in vicious gray tatlins. Every patch of dirt I have touched still breathing. I have survived the violent surveillance of desire. My blood is never blue when it leaks from my wounds. My mind is dismembered, my bones unworthy of death's supple paradise ever pillaged and never prized. On dusky pickled orange evenings where I have offered my skin to the junkyard gods of love, a ragged quilt of raw black diamonds blooms from every laceration skating up my thighs in the name of silence. A scream is a ritual. I do not often possess the magic to wield. The world has made complacency my only acceptable dowry, my P word, my only redeeming quality, my mouth a hollow velvet dumpster smelling of piss, graffitied by every other pain I've kept to myself in the name of being agreeable and agreeable is the key to surviving. Agreeable is how the skin stays stitched together, seems hidden and untorn, agreeable, is the name of every mother that has held her newborn daughter's feet to a soil rife with blood and patriarchy, whispering to her screaming product, one day you'll learn there are greater discomforts than this. Thank you for that, uh, for that space. Let's read that poem. Where was the other one? Advantage. This poem is called Advantage. There's, oh, there's also some cussing in this poem. Advantage. It's not okay to say rape and God go together, but did Mary ask for that baby? Our heavenly father is a B word. We all know, but never say why he didn't come do it himself, don a P word and face the men he fashioned from the dirt. God is not a woman. Women do their own work, cake their own fingers with the blood and rot of lust's sweaty bulge. Only a man shoves a child to trembling virgin arms and snarls suffer. Only a man denies a reluctant mother of her dignity, allows her to whelp a holy icon among lower creatures and their shit and their SHIT. Wasn't Mary, young and pure, almost stoned to death, flattened by the junkyard doctrine of her child's making. Father, creation won't be a woman for fear. It is one thing to watch the flesh forced to sin from the froth of heaven, but if he were forced to know what crimes his children coaxed from crying flesh, he'd rip the rainbows from our corporeal backdrop, strike down every endowed son of a bitch he made in his image. He'd crush their chins against their temple walls and paint their wives' names into the earth's riverbanks. But God is as much a businessman as he is a father peddling his daughters to thirsty men for silver and selling his books. He's busy working. He's got plans for us. No time to socialize. God cross crosses the threshold, drops wet rice into our laps and says, feed me, maybe I'll leave you alone tonight. One day he'll retire and will no longer be the bounty of his war on freedom. A woman's patience is worth all the golden linens to cry in. The ivory coffin set aflame on the rosy morose river. Heaven is somewhere in our silence. We've just got to wait for our peace of the holy war's justice. A pink porch flanked by quiet dancing lilies. The sun shining her purple majesty on our rested faces. Not a man in sight demanding we fill our bellies with his wishes, not a man in sight telling us what to do or how to hold anything, not a man in sight telling lies about why he's there. Thank you for that. Um, Okay.
so two more poems, both starting with epigraphs. Um, this one is after Lord. I know when I Lord everlasting we're trained with waiting to happen I will be driving home screaming I miss you to God's rough indifferent toes again the calloused peachy banks of the river will carry our love's grinning corpse to you the water ghosts will be sick of me crying for you as I gallop through their home in my glittering messy blue carriage I will always lower the clouded windows and wail to the ether on repeat let my phone ring but the ghost of a stray dog I will have previously swerved too late to miss will chase my car down river road every time I am playing a song you have not yet shown me. My lungs will tighten. I will submerge in regal grief. I will drown in your smoldering memory. I will be unable to burn the picture I have of you yet. I will not write about you until I know you're gone. So I will be driving down our cracked, angry road. I will beg the world to bring you to my door. I will scream at the water ghosts as ungratefully as I did before you arrived. And the dog, alive now but dead then, will fill my car with the stench of my grandmother's perfume and bark, let him go, baby. Finish that book you was writing. Thank you. So that, that's the first poem um, I wrote about my breakup with a man that didn't deserve my love. This next poem I'm going to read is the most recent poem I have written about the same breakup, about the same man that did not deserve my love. Um, this poem doesn't have a title yet, but I don't know. It just, it, it just, it, it don't have, it, it doesn't have a title yet, but it slaps. There's also a lot of cussing in this one. What does it feel like to have your needs met? I don't know. What does it feel like to have your needs met? I imagine fitting the final pieces in a puzzle resting on your heart. I imagine comfort. I imagine a deep breath, inhale, exhale, no worries. When did someone have those needs effed up? I do it constantly in exchange for mediocre D word, rust, rust and half love. No, oh, sorry, rust bleached and half love. I become a home to a colony of knives dressed up in a long coat and ruled by Venus. After finding out what my name means in the stolen tongue, only my ghosts know, I no longer believe that love and obsession can share the same planet. We have gotten it wrong. Love belongs to Saturn. We are given to our limitations and restrictions. Freedom does not live in the canyons you can fall into, chasing the wrong prey off cliffs you didn't bother to look out, of, out for. Everybody wants me to be their home, but nobody wants to dress my entrances in their blood and, and their prayers for protection. In words effed up, thinking I was the bee to ruin. Now look at us both, embarrassed and smoldering, ashes peeling off our skin while we shed the faded funk of each other. You should have listened to my limitations. You should have known better than to prey on me. Now you're missing teeth and searching for my feathers and all the cold air around you. Venus is a B word, ain't she? I'd hate for that to be my mother. I forgot to, I think I forgot to say the epigraph for that one, but the epigraph for that one is, in the blazing sun, I saw you. In the shadows, hiding from yourself. When the lights are on, I know you. 
See your grave from all the lies you tell. <laughs>